Well, welcome back to uh, UK Column Live. And as you can see, I've been joined in the studio by Trevor Jackson. Good afternoon, Trevor. Good afternoon, Brian. Well, I've got to say, you're, you're very smart. I've been forced to put a tie back on to raise <laughs> the standard of UK Column Live. So well done for that. Um, now, Trevor, you're going to tell us a bit about uh, your background and everything. And uh, I'm delighted to have another ex-Navy guy in the uh, studio today. But how did you come across UK Column Live? Um, I th just accidentally, I think, on uh, YouTube, I think I saw one of your um, your broadcasts. So, you know, right. just had a good listen and um, obviously we got, we got in touch after that. So um, yeah. that, that was how it was, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for doing that. And we're delighted to have um, Trevor with us today because uh, many people say that we're covering a lot of very heavy material and it's also important that we focus on positive things of what can be done to improve our lives. And of course, energy is a fundamental part of everything around us. And if we had access to at least cheap energy supplies or even free energy, my goodness, what a difference that could make. And really, without stealing too much of Trevor's thunder, what he's going to be talking about uh, in a few minutes is um, his work looking at... Um, Am I allowed to say fuel cell as opposed to battery? Yeah, it's a kind of fuel cell. It's, a, it's called a semi-fuel cell. It's half, halfway between a fuel cell and a battery. Right, OK. So it's not really a battery. All right, cell. but exciting stuff. And um, the whole point about what Trevor will be describing is that we can clearly see in a practical sense that there is real potential, no pun there, of course, um, to actually start producing energy in a different way. And that would allow us to break out of the stranglehold we're seeing at the moment from the uh, primary uh, energy suppliers. But a bit of background, you're an ex-Navy man, submariner. That's right, yeah, yeah. ex-resolution uh, ex class uh, ballistic missile submariner. Okay, uh, well we've got a picture of um, resolution here. I'm not sure when this was taken, but it's a very steely picture. And um, just tell us a little bit about the cycle. How long did you spend at sea if you did a patrol? Um, well, I was I was in I was there in the sort of bad old days. So we we did uh, three months underwater at once, which was uh, a bit grim, really. I think they they used to do six weeks. That that was fairly reasonable. So um, it meant that after about sort of week five, you were eating ch frozen chicken and um, some kind of uh, horrible brown soup that was made out of gravy brownie, I think it was. So right. we, we tended to sort of be a funny colour by the time we got off there. And, right. uh, so you were a nuclear engineer, so you That's spent right. most of your life at the back end of the, of the boat? I did, yes. Say. Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is what, early 80s? This was uh, 90, uh, right. late, late 80s, 90, and the okay. Cold, Cold War was on. Um, we, we did have uh, some visitors, some people who were very interested in where we were, just coming out of the Clyde. It was quite interesting, really, yeah. at the time. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, was, I was in the Navy at the time when the Berlin Wall came down. It was all, it was all a very uh, interesting sort of time. Period, yeah. yeah but, of yeah. course, many people are absolutely fascinated as to what life on board a submarine is like. We just thought we'd call up a couple of shots here just to get a bit of interest mm. and a bit of background. What, what are we looking at here, then? So we've got... Um, th this is known as the forest. This is uh, where all the missile tubes are. On this submarine, you've got 16 missile tubes, each containing an intercontinental ballistic missile with warheads on the top. Um, that's the deterrent, the UK deterrent, um, as it was. This was a Polaris system. It's an American Lockheed system, I think it is. Um, and this was our recreation space. So um, at one point we had a, um, an exercise bike um, appeared. I think it was about week three of a one patrol. And um, we could go down there and have a bit of a, a burn on the bike. And then somebody put a helpful calendar showing a, a Norwegian fjord which made it a lot better. And then we had a, somebody rigged a fan up, so we felt as though we were getting somewhere. So, getting uh, some fresh air. Yeah, so we, uh, this, this, this was the biggest area on the submarine. So um, um, it was serious business, but, you know... You, you, we've we've you, all learned a lot <laughs> since those days, basically, <laughs> about what the situation is and what's going on. That's right. Yeah. OK, well, just to um, continue our, our tour, of course, space is very cramped, and particularly in uh, sleeping quarters here. Yes, well, I was on the top bunk here. This, this is known as the sixth berth, and there were another three berths on the opposite side of this very small cabin. You had a very small locker to keep all your three months' supplies, and uh, so a couple of books yeah. and 
you know, probably a tape player, but uh, um, and there are a couple of sort of monkey bars that you swing up on yeah. um, into the top bunk, and uh, I had the privilege of having the ship's repeater clock next to my head, so right. um, it wasn't very comfortable for three months, but yeah. uh, there we are, an experience. Well, this is, this is where size counts, and basically, if, if you're a sensible height like myself, you get more space, isn't that how it works? <laughs> um, this is, uh, we've just got a couple, of more, couple more slides, I think, here, so this is the wardrobe. Um, looks a bit posed, this. Uh, Yes, yeah. Well, there was an armchair on ours too, which was a bit strange. And uh, the captain used to sit in the armchair and watch the movie, which yeah. was on a reel to reel. It was all really, really old fashioned and, uh, and good fun. Though, really I good have fun. To say we this. did, we did have some fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And um, many people be surprised, perhaps, at this uh, shot. This is part of the control room, and and steering a um, nuclear submarine around is a bit more akin to an aircraft than than a ship in many ways. Yeah, it is. The, basically, it, it's flying underwater. It's a bit like being in a spaceship altogether for the length of time that you're away and, and, and what you do. You, you carry all your food with you and you, you make all the oxygen and you, you clean the air up. Um, and um, you make your, make your own water. Uh, people smoke on board. It's a bit strange. They do have alcohol. Yeah. Um, but it's, um, it is, it's more like a spaceship than anything else. Yeah. And uh, I have to say that most of the, virtually all the submarines I've met um, have thoroughly enjoyed their time, you know. A lot of people, I, I sense, you know, they look, they've looked at the military, it's all shouting, people stamping their feet, shouting at each other, and that was never my experience no, in the system. It, yeah. it was good fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, um, let's, um, where do we start? What have you got yourself into? Well, I... Um, when I left the Navy, I went to work in British Aerospace and um, I had seven years there. And there was, a, there was a big move in the 90s to try and save money with um, submarines and, and basically take, take the reactor away and put something else in its place that could provide the power. So I, I was in a, um, a team in aerospace to, to look at to different options for that. So I started to look at things like uh, hydrogen fuel cells, um, a closed cycle diesel that would rebreathe its exhaust with the addition of a bit of uh, oxygen, um, Stirling engines, and some batteries. And um, through the through the battery, uh, you know, research, I started to get an interest in batteries and fuel cells. Yeah. Um, so in 1999, I left um, I left uh, British Aerospace for my own company, Fuel Cell Integration Limited, to do research, to do private research into fuel cells oh, and. Nice. That turned into a kind of battery, which is a semi-fuel cell. So that's how I got into it, um, and that's led you on quite quite a journey altogether. That's right. Yeah, I've um, I've had quite a quite a, you know, a lot of experience with <laughs> with yeah. both the technology and the impacts of the te technology on. The um, politics around on it. the people yeah. who are who are looking at yeah. it, the the politics, the, the economics, and so on, and it's been quite quite fascinating, really. But uh, right, okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to attempt something um, we've never done before, which is a live demonstration. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see how it goes. Just explain, obviously, as, as you're going, what 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 we've got in front of us, and uh, and what's going to happen. Right. Well, what this is. Um, We've also got a little, little electric motor with a fan, two cables, uh, no ba where are we? Uh, no batteries uh, anywhere, but my no sleeves magic. anywhere. No, no magic. magic basically. There's yeah. a piece of uh, J cloth on there, just as an, an absorbent piece of, of cloth, which I can just show you. It's, it's wet with um, salt solution. There's just uh, saline table salts and, and water, but this, this particular piece of um, material, I'll just try and hold that steady, Th this, is, this is the clever bit which is, is called a, a cathode, it's an air cathode, so this is an air breathing battery in a way, it's an air breathing fuel cell, and what happens is, so if I show, show it like that, what happens is on the white side, this is the air side, and the air, the oxygen in the air goes through this um, permeable membrane, and it splits into the in the black side. So this is the wet side, and um, 
what happens is the oxygen ions then um, react with the with this material, which is just aluminium. This this plate is an aluminium plate. It's just ordinary aluminium. And um, hopefully, as a live demonstration, yeah. So we we can produce useful power from a a piece of aluminium. Um, and a small piece of this material, which isn't very expensive. And what happens is, at the moment, is the, the aluminium is breaking down into the stuff that you use in anti-acid tablets, which is al aluminium hydroxide. Um, so it's not exactly dangerous. You can see I'm touching it. I'm, it's only salt water. There isn't any danger to me here. Um, it barely gets warm uh, in, in, in the operation. And it consumes the aluminium. Um, which can then be recycled because it is the feedstock for making aluminium in the first place. So um, that's really the, the basis of the technology. Which is pretty amazing. How long would that carry on running that, with that tiny little okay. cathode there? Well, um, it, it's normally a few weeks with this sort of power. Uh, a couple of weeks I've, I've left things like this running and... Um, gone away on holiday and forgotten all about them and then come back and it's still running. So um, it, it's what its main characteristic is that it, it can run and run and run until the aluminium's gone. It's not a it's not a battery as such. It doesn't you don't recharge it so it doesn't have a discharge curve, which means that it delivers the same power all the time until the aluminium's gone. And that's quite handy for a vehicle. So right. I naturally started to look into how that could be applied. Um, in, 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 a, in, a, in another application, so right. well, I must admit, we, we, Mike and myself, and in, in Mike and I enjoyed the uh, demonstration we saw with you at Tavistock. It, it's uh, really quite impressive. Um, I'll just jump back to the previous slide because you, you've mentioned you're operating under one company, but this is you. This is you now, isn't it? That's right. So th this this company is uh, called Metalectric Limited, um, and this is the. the, the the vehicle that um, it's become a brand in a way. Um, this is the vehicle that I use to to tell people about this technology and to work with other with other companies and so on right. about that. So um, okay, so we're, you're going to talk us through really a bit more about the battery technology and, and scaled up. So we're yeah, we're getting to a bit more that, to a practical use. That's right. So. I think first of all, it's important for me to say that I didn't invent this technology. I've I've modified the technology. The, this technology was invented in about 1964. The, the first papers I've read are, are then, yeah. um, and there have been teams um, through the through the through that period that have been working on using this in a vehicle. And, and I think the next slide is so, is so relating to that. So, so this is. Um, this is an, an early 19 sort of 80s um, part of a battery, part of a, I keep saying battery, I, I, it, part of a semi-fuel cell, an aluminium semi-fuel cell. And this was done by, I think it was LTEC Systems in the States. Can you describe um, the components there very simply for people? Yeah, sure. There's, um, you can see that the, there's a marked um, anode assembly, which is really the, um, just a piece of aluminium plate. Um, there's a, a G, the GDE is the gas diffusion electrode, which is basically the black and white uh, material that I showed you uh, on the demonstration. And then there are some support frames and, and power takeoffs uh, on there. And that, that's really all you need for the battery, apart from on this particular one, they've got an electrolyte um, inlet and discharge to, to get a flow through the battery. Um, the reason for that is because um, they're using a, an electrolyte, which is the liquid in the battery, to, um, which is quite caustic and, and it's quite difficult to work with. So th there's more, more engineering in this kind of battery than in the, in the version that we've got. I keep, again, keep right. using the what, word battery. The, but, uh, <coughs> the thing we're looking at, what's the sort of, sorry, the, the, the scale there? So the, the scale of this, I th it's difficult. I, I don't quite know. Um, I think it's probably about, from memory, probably about um, what's ten inches. It's probably um, well, ten, <laughs> ten inches in is centimeters. Right? Yeah. yeah, can't remember okay, now. Yeah, 20 twenty-five centimeters square. I think it is. It's uh, of the order of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. 
All right, excellent. And um, this one is um, a diagrammatic of a uh, some form of a state car from the American, I think. Yeah, th this was done by um, Alcan, the aluminium foil people, and this is showing a, you know, I think it's a Chevrolet microbus with a lead acid battery pack which is slung low down uh, and you can see that uh, in the middle there. There's a that must be a huge weight. If those are lead acid batteries, that, that's one heavy vehicle. It's enormous. It's probably nearly half a tonne of battery, right. I would say. Um, what they did with this vehicle, they, they, it was an existing electric vehicle uh, that had a 52 kilometre range with just on the lead acid pack. So they, they, I met the guys who did this um, and they said they literally just got a, a useful container, plastic container, I think it was some kind of a file storage box or something from the office. And um, they created this aluminium air battery or fuel cell, which you can see in the front of the car there, there's a, a box just underneath the bonnet and they increased the range to 152 kilometers uh, which was huge really so they it was a one-off one one shot demonstration uh, but it did demonstrate a superior range right. um, over and above a lead acid only pack and when when will be would we be talking about this it's about 82 1982 oh, right. okay. so, so still quite a long time ago yeah yeah, yeah. the um, the Alcan team ran up until about 19, what was it, 88 I think it was, and then it was, I think then they went on to uh, hydrogen fuel cell work, and oh. I think a lot retired, and it wasn't, it wasn't continued. Yeah. And the reason that it wasn't continued was just engineering and cost, so because they were using um, a caustic electrolyte, like a, a hydroxide, like caustic soda really, um, it plays havoc with the materials in, in, the, in, the, in the battery, right. so you've got to use, it's quite hard work to put your seals in place to make sure the seals don't corrode and don't get eaten away. But more importantly, the, um, the effect of it on the aluminium is that you get a tremendous amount of heat and a tremendous amount of hydrogen produced, right. and you get this very uneven um, corrosion of the aluminium, and it looks like a moonscape fairly quickly. Yeah. It's very difficult to control. Are quite dangerous to deal with in terms of its. Um, you try to re replate a battery like that. You, you've, you've you've got sort of special personal protective gear and. Yeah. But I think the worst thing for what, what for them was was the cost. Right. Because okay. they they went from that to try and clean it up. They went to a very high purity aluminium uh, sheet, right. which was more expensive than gold. So the business case. This this was basically engineers saying well. Well, we're going to solve this by technical means, but the, of course the accountants started to kick in and say, excuse me, that doesn't work as, yeah. a, as a business. Right. And I think those two factors came together uh, and conspired to, to stop the work, which was understandable at the time. Okay. Um, now, you're going to take us through a bit of um, technical stuff here. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to say, I, I can imagine we've got two types of viewers. We've got viewers who are very interested in the overall concept of uh, energy and what we can do ultimately to mm. maybe power our house. Uh, but we've got other people who we know are extremely interested in the technology itself. So we are going to get into the technology in a bit of detail here. Yeah, sure. And um, hopefully those people will be quite happy. I'll just mention the name John while I say that. So what have we got here? Um, right. Uh, we can, we'll be able to blow this up. Um, we've, we can blow both these two graphs up when you've given us a sort of overall description, really. Okay. So these are these are the results of actual tests that were done in France um, in a company called Metalectric SAS, which was the French um, predecessor to Metalectric Limited, which was was my company that I formed in France some time ago. So these, these were done in a laboratory, um, and what you've got is two different curves. You've got the blue curve, um, and you've got the pink curve. So the blue curve is showing you what happens, um, like I've just shown you, with, it, with salt water. So this is, these are battery... Um, Shall we expand that yeah, top Yeah, one? let's, let's do the top one. Help. Let's see whether, yeah. So here we are. This, this is... Um, <coughs> This is showing you that the, the, pink, the pink line is, is giving a shift to the left. So what that means 
uh, is that the battery is now starting to behave more in an automotive power type way. Whereas if you go to the left, onto the blue line, this is more to do with um, navigation buoys, which are, do have aluminium air um, battery variants. Uh, and, and you get you know, good steady power, but at a low, at a low voltage, right. which isn't that useful for a, for a car. So the shift is very important. So this demonstrates that with the development of the electrolyte, which I, I did in, in the company, this is the key uh, change. Um, that, um, that the battery it becomes useful in, a, in an automotive sense, but without the attendant engineering problems yeah, that yeah. we had before. So, right. but it's it's giving it's giving high power, which it sustains as a peak over a long period for a of long time, time without dropping off or decaying. Yeah, it does. And the ne the next curve is is a, a very good example of that. Okay. So this, this is showing you the flat nature of the curve. I, I said to you that it's not really a battery. It doesn't have a discharge characteristic. If you were looking at a, a curve on a, of a normal battery like a lithium ion or lead acid or whatever, then as you move from left to right, then the, the, the battery will start to droop. The curve will start to droop as, it, as the battery starts to uh, get more and more depleted of, um, of its energy. But um, because this is the energy is coming from aluminium, it, it isn't charged like a battery, so it's there already, and it just it only just drops off completely when the aluminium is run out. But in in this curve, the, the import, in this graph, the important the important point is is the the current density, which is an index of the power of the battery, is up around the sort of two hundred mark. This is milliamps per square centimeter, which I know this, it's a bit technical, but that's where we need to be with a vehicle. Right. With, with, the, with the demonstration I showed you, that's down at the sort of 50 level, which is the blue line, which is salt water. You can't really run an electric vehicle off salt water, so right. it's important that we get the, the pink line uh, that, characteristic. Okay, when we were talking to you in your workshop, if I remember correctly, you sort of gave us a, um, um, an approximation by saying that if a lead acid battery had a uh, had a performance of a hundred. Yeah, you, you correct me if I don't remember this right. A uh, um, lithium battery would be. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'll 10 kick it. Hundred. I'll you kick explain it. it. Yeah. yeah. So um, lead acid, you're looking at a, an energy density. The, the important thing about batteries in terms of vehicles is the amount of energy that you can you can carry around per kilogram. Right. So we express that in watt hours per kilogram. So some people use uh, ampere hours, but we use watt hours, which is a proper, a proper um, expression of energy. So for, for, um, an, for a lead acid battery, you're looking at about 30 to 50 watt hours per kilogram. For a, for a lithium ion, you're looking at about 140 practically. And for our technology, you're looking at about 1,350. So we are about nine to 10 times the better than a lithium, than a lithium ion, yeah. Right. So that's why our, with a lithium ion, if, if they do 100 miles, you know, we're, we're nearing the 1,000 mile. You know, it, it's, it's inherent in the way that the battery works. And part of the reason is, as you, as you can see, we're using air as half of the battery. That's why it's called a semi-fuel cell. So we're not carrying around another metal plate. So we've, we've actually halved the weight of the battery to start off with. Apart, apart from that, we're getting more reactivity per, re per reaction yeah. because of the chemical nature. And you're using aluminium, which is lightweight. And it's lightweight, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, now this is, um, this is, uh, this document, is this documentation available on, on your website or was it a... It is, yeah. yeah it, it, is, so. it, it is. If you go on to metalectric.co.uk, uh, there's, a, there's a, a tab that takes you on to the example of how this works in a vehicle and all this information is on there. So this is really showing you um, the reaction, which I won't go through. It's, if you've got an interest in it, it's all yeah, there. Um, Sorry, that seems a little bit washed out. We thought we had the colours correct on that, but I obviously didn't. <laughs> and, okay. and I suppose that the the simplicity of the battery is really what I would note off this diagram. It's just it's just a plate formed, uh, a plate a plate form, a planar form of battery. It's very thin. Um, there's not a lot going on. It's you know it's not very exciting, um, but it's just an aluminium plate. There's some electrolyte, and then there's this fancy membrane. 
and the, the, there are power takeoffs both from the aluminium plate and from the membrane. So right. that, and it's, it's as simple as that. We're going to talk a bit more about the sort of company side and, and what's happened, but it's Electrolyte, which is your baby, as it were. It is primarily it's the Electrolyte. We've we've obviously learnt a lot about about the technology and the geometry of things and what's what's best in practice to, yeah. to achieve it and that we 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 have that and knowledge that too trade and we, we, own, we own that too yeah but, yeah um, yeah that's fine yeah, that's true okay so if we move on here this is um, product development from should come up Mike is it brilliant thank you um, Okay. So this is another section of the website, product development. Um, what, are, what are we looking at here? So the first two graphics, you've got an exploded view of something called MAPS, which is Metalectric Advanced Aluminium Power System, and then there's a photo of the thing underneath. And this is basically a, a cell which um, we, we did in France, which uh, is, it has a rotational, uh, it's an interesting design, it's got a, a rotating component inside, which manages its, all of its um, uh, dynamic and electrical behaviour, but without going into it, 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 it has a purpose. So, a bit of a strange looking battery, but uh, and this stacks up, so you've got posneg, posneg as you, as you go up. It's a bit like an old-fashioned uh, cell you'd find in a, um, a museum in, in, in the way that it looks, but its performance is a bit better. Right. Um, Shall I just read a little bit yeah, here sure. from, from my screen, um, also to, to help people uh, just who are just listening this afternoon. So we're looking at um, uh, Meta, Meta Electric Advanced Aluminium Power System, MAPS. This is a new kind of mobile electric power system. It's somewhere between a battery and a fuel cell. It's CO2 free and, and the thing is refueled, it's not recharged. This is done by automatic cassette exchange at a vehicle service point, but the range is much longer than for a recharge rechargeable battery, so these exchanges are infrequent. And then you've um, listed some important key features. Uh, starts and stops the chemical reaction on demand, keeps the reactive surface clear, manages air and electrolyte transfer, it's designed to be refuelled, it, it comes in a cassette system, um, it's industrial automatic high speed refuelling, so you're not going to have to hang around waiting to be refuelled, and a very important thing for a lot of people is it's recyclable. Hmm. recyclable. So this is a lot of very positive points on this uh, cell. It is. It's, it's essentially about the greenest, in every sense, battery that uh, I can imagine. Um, you know, there's, a, there's the, the carbon dioxide aspect which uh, people and the government do want. I mean, that's sort of dead centre in terms of its policy. So if you take the whole cycle for the production of aluminium, at the moment, um, Aluminium produces seven kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of aluminium, which is very high. But the reason that it does that is because the um, the, the uh, anodes, the heaters that are cooking the, uh, the hydroxide and making aluminium in the first place, are made of carbon. Right. Now you, you can change that, and, and the aluminium the, the aluminium industry is is doing that. So they're moving to an inert uh, tungsten, I think it is anode. Yeah. to make the aluminium. So there won't be any CO2, so it, it can go zero. So when I say oh, it's a zero CO2 system, sure the battery itself isn't giving any CO2 off, but also the, 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 the process that backs the battery up in terms of production right. of aluminium can reduce it an enormous amount, back okay. probably to zero. So there's that, plus all the, the components are recyclable. It's largely plastic that we're, t that we're dealing with here and aluminium hydroxide. Which yeah, and as you've dem demonstrated yeah. here in the studio, you can touch this stuff and you're not going to get hurt by no, it. No, yeah. it's safe. Well, I'm not going to jump too far ahead, but mm. perhaps it's appropriate to say. Mike? Well, we have a couple of questions, if I'm allowed. Of course. Yeah. Sure. Uh, right. First, first question is uh, cost per kilowatt hour, if you could give an estimate of that. Okay. Well, we're, d we're, we're involved in the uh, vehicle side of things, so it's more to do with cost per mile that we deal with. So 
I mean, I'd have to come back with a, a, a formal answer. I don't want to give the wrong answer without having to refer into calculations. So, but cost per mile uh, in comparison to the SMMT figure of 17 pence a mile, we're about 9 pence a mile. So, so it gives you what's SMMT? That's the so Society for Motor Manufacturers. It's the it's the UK formal automotive body that uh, pronounces on what things cost in the automotive world. So um, we're comfortably within that. I, if you're talking about home power units, um, which may be the source of the question, that you know you, you you could look at your electricity bill and try and divide that by the amount of kilowatts that you've used, you probably get the proper cost per kilowatt hour there. I don't know what the segment of the bill that says cost per kilowatt hour actually says these days. We're not aiming really at home power units, but at, you know, it could well be that it's cheaper than what people are paying at the moment. Yeah, and, and the other question that came in was uh, was about was about the patent issue. Are you get, going to get onto that later on, or could, could we do that? I can deal with it now, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, I was advised quite a while ago uh, not to patent um, and not to attempt to patent the electrolyte. I think uh, there are some issues with patenting uh, chemical formulas and the, dis the level of disclosure is very high when you do that. Um, so Coca-Cola haven't patented their chemical formula and they've done quite well out of it. I think um, because we know what's in the material uh, and we know that it's a trace, that there are, it's just a trace level of combinations of very almost homeopathic level uh, additives. We think that uh, having looked at the, the mass spectrometer output of the analysis mm -hmm. of this stuff, it's, it's almost impossible to tell what's in there. So, it, you know, I, I'm not particularly worried about that. In terms of the, um, the intellectual property on the cell design itself, we may patent some of those things, um, but patenting is really just telling everybody what you're doing. Um, and it just, you know, you're going to get into litigation straight away. The, uh, this, uh, the question, we understand why somebody's come up with that question. I'm going to say that um, in today's interview, we decided we were going to focus on, on the basics of, of what this um, semi-fuel cell is. We are going to touch a bit on some of the... Um, uh, well, it is a bit of a battle you've had in trying to get support for this uh, particular product, which is quite interesting. I'm going to say that in the discussions we've had with, uh, with Trevor, there's been um, a lot of other things going on in the background. We don't feel it's appropriate to cover um, that in detail this time, but maybe that will come up in the future. But I'm going to say what I know from, from the chat that we've had in your workshop is that, uh, my goodness, when you start to produce something which could really change the way we're using energy, and certainly in a car sense, make a real difference, um, it's not straightforward. And um, you have had a bit of a battle to protect uh, what you've got here. Yeah. That's the simple explanation, isn't it? True. It was good advice. The, the patent advice was good yeah. advice. And the other yeah. thing I'm going to say is that um, uh, when we were with Trevor in his workshop, one of the things that he proudly showed us were some very simple applications of this technology which would have been great help in somewhere like Africa. Hmm. Um, so one of the, uh, uh, shame we didn't get you to bring it along, but never mind, was, was basically a small container, a little bit bigger than a beer can, and uh, with an aluminium can placed inside with your electrolyte, that was enough to, to deliver sufficient power for a small radio or a fan or something else. I yeah, think that's, th that's the ICANN. Um, if you look on um, 3W's ICANNEEC, that's I-Q-U-E dot com, uh, you'll see the ICANN there. And it's on YouTube under Jack T. Sun, if you look under that. Right. Um, so, so, yeah, you, you, can, you, can, you can make power. I mean, you, you say, but what's the cost per kilowatt hour? Actually, you could make a home power digester unit which uses aluminium packaging and when you bought the sausages or whatever it is from the shop, you didn't buy the packaging, you bought the sausages. So it's free, the power's free if you want. Um, my wife and I saved up about half a kilo of aluminium in about a day, just, in, just from packaging. Um, so, you know, it is power that's sat there, probably just going into the bin, into landfill, which you could actually use to offset your, your costs at home. Yeah. So. So I, I, I put that uh, point across because uh, I'd just like people to understand that um, Trevor hasn't only been looking at um, uh, 
uh, the vehicle application, but how this could be used to benefit other people, including mm. people on very low or subsistence income. So I think that's got some quite exciting applications. And I'm going to add at this point, uh, most people would have thought that um, the government and other bodies would be almost biting your hand off to get hold of this. We'll, we'll save the comment because we've got some documents to have a look at in a minute. Mm. Um, but that hasn't been the case, is it? Funnily enough, no. No. Right. No. Okay. Well, look, let's um, have a look a bit more of the technical side here so that the buffs out there are satisfied that, that what's being described is, a, is, um, is real, tangible and effective. Yeah, well, th this, this curve was done by um, the UK Trade and Industries um, Scientific Advisor. And this, this paper was written um, about Metalectric and the, our technology. So and this is comparing you against other technologies, relative performance of Metalectric. Um, that's right. Yeah. It, so it's in it, against it, other technologies. Yeah. That's it. And without too much. Uh, Exaggeration. This is, these aren't my curves. That this is from a, a, a scientist. So um, th 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 we're sort of top of the pops here in all respects. Where, where are you? In we're this with the red line. With the red line at the top. Right. And just explain what that actually means. So it, that means that in terms of the best option for the combination of how much energy you get and how much power you get per kilo, uh, we cover. Um, we're, we're. If you look at the scales, they are logarithmic. So we're an awful lot better than the other than the competition, both in terms of um, in the combination of power and uh, energy. So uh, you know the the, the others ca can't match that performance. Right, which is really quite outstanding. It is outstanding. Yeah, yeah. and um, we've got another one here. This is um, a cost comparison. Um, this is an annualised cost based on, an, on a, a, vi a small vehicle pack that was for a, a micro car. Um, and we're the, I don't know what colour you'd call that really, but the sort of brownie coloured, light brown coloured line at the bottom. So we're actually cheaper over a seven year period than any other technology uh, in terms of, in terms of va available battery technologies. So this is um, total cost, annualised cost. Um, so you know, th this was done by others. It's not. It's not my. Yeah. Not my curve. But it's you know what we're seeing here is it's not just the question that that this this product is doing well. It's outperforming everything else that's being thrown at yeah, it, it at is. the moment. So it, it, I, I'm going to say it because well yeah you're here with me in the studio. But we seem to have something which is world leading. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clean. It's ticking all the boxes. So we're CO2 free. Mm. Uh, non-toxic, easily to ha easy to handle, can be. It's got lots of ticks in the boxes, but you aren't getting the support. Well, I'm not getting money support. I'm getting sort of intangible support from the government, which is sort of you know things like introductions to companies and things like that. But um, we've we recently applied for a, a technology strategy board uh, grant to take us a bit further forward and we got knocked back with that. So I can't think of any other technology that is so dead centre in what the government advertises. You're saying they want. They're saying they want, yeah. yeah. And um, yet we just, we just can't get it. And that wasn't for an awful lot of money. So, because I, I've invested an awful lot in it myself and as I, as I mentioned yeah. to you before, um, I'm committed to it because it works. I'm an engineer, I'm a practical guy. I'll keep going. If something works, I'll just keep going. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you? That's my yeah. job. So I expect other people to do their job too, which is to actually kick in with a bit of cash. And some, we've had some small investment, and that's been very well, you know, but it's been private investment. Yeah. But we can't get all the way to the market without, um, you know, some yeah. pretty much without the, the endorsement of the government formally, I think, yeah. and without everything that that brings, which is all of the yeah. institutional investors. But without, without getting overly political, we, we, so we're, just, we're just talking in a, in a common sense way. Mm. We've, got, we've, got, we've, got, we've had Labour governments, we've got Conservative governments are saying that they want this clean type of technology. Mm. But when you've actually come up with something where the um, technical proof is there, 
um, you're not getting a you're not getting a backup which says right let's really start to see whether we can get this stuff out and in no. in production yeah and uh, Mike and I drove up the A38 yesterday I can't remember exactly where it was I think um, a bit before Taunton but uh, we were looking at fields now being covered in photovoltaic cells um, it was overcast and very grey at the time. don't know whether you want to comment on that, Mike. No, but I do have another question here yeah. uh, asking, uh, can people invest in your company? Yes, they can, yeah. yeah. Just, get, just get in touch. Just get in touch, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right, so we've got a little bit more um, on the battery itself here. This is a sort of um, uh, schematic layout of yeah. how the packs would be. Okay, well this, this is, um, I've got to be st start to be careful about who, which names I mention. I'm in a few agreements with a few people and there's a, a very nice uh, bunch of chaps who, who run a, a really, they're a really good company who run a very famous racing car company and production car company in the UK, a British company. Probably foreign owned now, um, can't say who they are, but anyway, they've got in their nice workshop um, on their airfield, shan't say any more than that. Um, they've got a very nice free to us Nissan Leaf and we've had a good look at that. We've worked with this company um, to define what we need to do to get the technology mature enough to replace the Nissan Leaf existing battery. And the, the schematic you can see in the grey there is, is the actual layout of what's inside a Nissan Leaf. Um, at the moment, and these these are uh, lithium ion um, modules. Uh, but what we're doing is we're we're just mimicking that shape and and weight, and we're just fitting our system into that same volume and weight. Right. So you you've sort of surprised some of the industry a bit because they've been working on their own solutions, even to the fact that they you know they've got uh, what do we call them test prototypes ready to go with. Mm with particular battery packs, you've come along, they're recognising that this system works. Yeah. And you are getting the opportunity to put in an alternative um, uh, layout of your own equipment. That's right. It isn't all gloom and doom. You know, we, yeah. the, the, from the technical side, all the engineers are, are, are really yeah. up for this. It's, it's just the money man. You know, yeah. so it, 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 th that's, the, that's the thing. But we, this is technically feasible. We're on a programme with this quite famous company to deliver this now, yeah. and, on, and on the way, we're going to do we're going to do this demonstration in a, a little G Wiz, which is a bit later on this year. So, um, Sorry, which is what the, is a G Wiz? That little blue car that you saw right, in the, yeah. in the lab. And that was Indian, I think. Was it? That's an Indian car, yeah. Right. So th that's quite popular in London, and it's currently got a 50 mile range with lead acid batteries. But as I said, our energy density is huge compared right. to to that. So it looks as though from the bench test that we've got that we can give it about 1,500 miles, right. which is outstanding. But it's, a, so it's just aluminium. It's a side effect of the amount of aluminium we can put in there. So, so roughly we're um, aiming to do that this year. Just give um, audience an idea. In my mind, that was roughly the size of a smart car. Hmm. Would that be correct? It is, yeah. 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 And, and at the moment, it does 50 miles yeah. on, a ch on a charge, and you would be able to give it? About 1,500. 1,500. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. for the same mass and the same volume. Yeah. Uh, but if it's a small battery compartment, if you, if you scale the car up to the Nissan Leaf, the, the, the Nissan Leaf... Um, sorry, is that this one here? Sorry, the, the, this is the... I don't know, sorry, I, I'm not sure what, what car that, that okay. is. I think that's a Renault. But this is an example of... Um, this is the battery swap um, concept, and this is Shia Gassi to the right there, who's uh, the head of Better Place, or he just, he just, he just stepped down. But this is a battery swap machine, which... Um, so the technology for swapping batteries in cars is already there. We don't have to right, do so that. Just, just to make absolutely clear then for the audience, yeah. um, what, what's going to happen is you drive your vehicle into um, um, a depot area. Like a car wash. Car yeah. wash area. Yeah. You stay in the car, you stay clean, and basically an automated machine takes out the old um, semi fuel, fuel cell, cell yeah. and puts the a pack. new one in. That's right. So you, you're, you're not... It's like a gas canister idea. So you've got a somebody's just refueled, it, given you a new, freshly fueled gas canister. But in this case, yeah. it's just a freshly plated pack, power right. pack. 
So you've got another 500 miles or whatever we can fit into the space. In terms of the Nissan Leaf, the difference between that and the um, the, the the car that we're the, the little car that we're we're, we're working on at the moment is that um, there's less room in the battery pack to give yeah. us that range. So we're we're aiming for about a 500 mile range with the Nissan Leaf. We might be able to get a bit more out of it. But right. Uh, um, you told me that one one of the problems that you'd had was that because the weight of this system is so much lower, you mm. actually for the purpose of these tests, having to increase the weight we did, in yeah. order to maintain centre of gravity and performance. That, that's right. On the G, on the G Wiz, this is why we've got such a huge range because we've added we've had to add a load more aluminium into the pack right. design so that we can bring the mass up. Otherwise, the handling. I mean, you, you know, you can't really talk about handling in a G Wiz if you've ever ever driven one. It's handling right. and G Wiz probably don't go in the same sentence, but. Um, we we need to do that, otherwise we'd have to go back through the homologation checks for the for the vehicle, because right. the sense of gravity and the mass of the vehicle would have altered significantly. Okay. So no, we I'm don't just, want to do that. I'm just yeah. sensing that maybe there's somebody out there who's saying, well, you know, you're using a lot of aluminium here. What about what about the impact of that aluminium on the? I'm being emotive here mm, on the mm. environment. What 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 actually happens once a battery um, once the Semi cell <laughs> fuel cell has yeah. run. What what hap What are you left with? Well, you're left with a, a sort of light grey gel. So right. it's as I say, it's the stuff that's in anti acid tablets. So you, if you wanted to, you could eat it, but you probably, it's probably well, it's not going to do good you a lot of Louise, good. Yeah, she, she'd, be, <laughs> so, she'd be saying we're jumping from a spa team to uh, yeah. Um, so we don't recommend that, um, but um, that's collected and that's dried and it's right. shipped back to the smelter because it's actually pure commodity alumina, it's called. And this is the stuff that the aluminium guys are dreaming of to make the aluminium in the first place. When they make aluminium, they mine rock, which is bauxite. They, they're getting the... Um, huge, huge energy. Huge, huge. Yeah. They've got a load of uh, lakes full of uh, caustic material which have leaked and caused huge problems and, and so on. Well, we're, we're coming in right at the end of the process because we're going to supply them with the really nice white, finely divided powder which they shove straight into their smelting pots. Right. And they, re they melt that because it's it's, it is aluminium hydroxide that's it's very pure. So we can charge a bit more for that. If, unless we end up buying a smelter, which is a bit in the future. But um, at the moment, the economics work out. So all that's taken into account in the cost per mile. So um, we can sell that back at a reasonable price and then get the aluminium right. back. So the, what you're really paying for is the energy that goes into making aluminium, which is quite significant. But you know, you, you've got to pay to drive. So yeah. it's not free, there's no free ride here. Yeah. But again, um, you know, in, in, in my mind, and you know, we've had the advantage of spending a bit more time with you, this thing is getting ticks in the box all the way through, mm. but you're still not getting government. It really comes down to this business of should the government be supporting. It says, that the government says in all the brochures I've ever come across that it's supporting innovation, it wants incubator businesses, I'm using all the okay terms here, um, it's going to get small independent businesses into production. It wants clean, green energy. Yeah, so it does. what I've been doing while you're describing this system is I'm mentally ticking off all of the things the government says it wants. And then I think you'll, you'll be a little bit uh, kind on the machinery here because when you go to the very people who should be backing these sorts of ideas, uh, what are you into? A gentleman's club where... Um, I can introduce you to somebody who may help you. Is that what you mean by it? Um, I t I, as I say, I'm, with being an engineer, I deal with engineers. So everybody I speak to is, to is lit up yeah. you know, with, with it. Says, that, that's what we want to do. I've had it so many times. I've been yeah. to all sorts of places in France and here. And they yeah. say, oh, you know, green energy. Right. You know. And, 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 but the, what happens is it's almost as though somebody makes a phone call after the discussion, and then suddenly everything's switched off. Right. So it's, it's almost like the money men have to support the, the selected technology. I mean, some somebody is there somebody in the background saying, "Yes, you can go ahead with yeah, this technology," or, or, or no. As I say, I, I, can, I can't say that the government aren't supporting me because they are, and I can't say that they're not 
not enthusiastic because they are, and they have, and as we'll go through a bit later but, on, but I'll show you. But support's got to be tangible, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't think the, go uh, to be fair, uh, the government, as far as I know, our tax, our tax money, the part of our tax money that's ring-fenced, to use a well-worn term, um, for this kind of thing comes through the Technology Strategy Board, and it's a very small amount of money. Yeah. And there are a lot of big uh, automotive companies who need their R&D departments keeping going. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you could, the reality of it is that it's used for that, mainly. The, and new people, new kids on the block, very rarely get a, get a look in. So I don't think there's anything malicious about it, but I think the real money is external to the government. Right. And, and I, in my own view, the, there seems to be two things I'm dealing with. The people who say yes, and then the people who come in at the end and turn that off. Yeah. So I don't know who that is. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are just my ideas. I, I don't know. I just don't know. But this okay. is my experience. Okay, that's through. fine. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to put a comment here and say that uh, Trevor's here with us in the studio, looking very smart and relaxed. But you've been through quite a, quite a battle to to try and get this thing into production. Yeah. yeah. Um, am I allowed just to comment on relative? Um, um, support between France and UK? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, what, what you've indicated today is that, that while you found it difficult to get backing from the UK government, there was a period where you got some real support from the French. You came in and said, Monsieur, we like your technology. We think we could help you. That's right. Right. That, that's my experience. So, I mean, we can go through the, uh, the slides and things. Maybe a bit. I don't know if this is the time to do that. Well, we're, so we're moving into it. Let's just um, yeah. we'll just check out. Just to well, in fact, we are, aren't we? Because we're coming into business cards here. Cornwall experience. You asked. Oh yes, mind, yeah, right? the Cornwall experience. Right. So, in in two thousand or two thousand and one, I hired a small research lab in uh, Callington in Cornwall. Right. Um, and I sat there and read everything on aluminium air that had ever been published, so the hundreds and hundreds of technical papers and, and, and so on. And I did a lot of tests, and I put a few things together. I did some of my own development. I'm a, I'm a development engineer, from, that's my training. Right. Um, so I spent six months in there d doing that non-stop, just on my own. Um, and I got results, I got good results uh, that I could, I could measure. And so on the basis of that, um, I felt that this technology had legs. I mean, I'm, I'm a serious engineer. I've been doing it for 30 years, so um, I tend not yeah. to muck around with things that don't work. Um, so I, was co I became convinced. I went to Business Link. Um, they couldn't help. There was a talk of a smart award, and um, it all seemed a bit so strange. So bi Business Link is, I think most people would say Business Link comes under a quango. It's government, but it's not quite government. Yeah. It, it, it was a sort of 10k amount, which was going to be a, a contribution, a kick off, and you had to match it. And that, not, but it, anyway, it just didn't happen. I then met. Um, I got a visit from um, what's it, Jim Knight MP, the Right Honourable Jim Knight MP, who was the Minister for Rural Affairs at the time, and um, he. He, with his entourage, he he was. I demonstrated to him formally. A bit like this, but with a uh, you know about six cells, so there was quite a high power demonstration. Um, I went through it in detail. I gave him a pack of information and a fuel cell to play with, and he said to me, "Well, it'll probably uh, not serious, but he said to me, I'll show Tony, you know, and see what he thinks." Yeah. And I was in email contact on the run up to this meeting with Jim Knight, and. Um, and after that, there was just no contact whatsoever. So you can understand, I was getting a bit frustrated. I, here, I, I could see there was some yeah. value in doing this. There was all talk about green energy and, and all this sort of thing. And I thought, well, you know, th this is it. You know, th this is one. This is one, one type of green energy. And uh, so for some reason, I don't, I don't know why, I, um, I phoned up the French Embassy in London and um, there's a card right, that we can bring come that on one to. Up again there. It's just the, the next one. Is it one. the next one up? Yeah. Okay, well, we, we can always come back. To, oh, sorry. Why is that? Sorry, that's my fault. Hold on. Here we go. Yeah, so the bottom left is Invest in France Agency, and, and this is in, based in London. Um, 
you know, all the embassy part of London. And um, I, took a, I took the same demonstration that I'd shown Jim Knight and uh, showed it to the head of the uh, Investing Funds Agency. And he, he, he was an engineer, so maybe that's just easier to deal with. He said, oh, you know, I really like that. That's, that's very sexy, monsieur, you know. And he said, uh, where do you want to go in France? He said, that's pretty crunchy, pretty upfront. And, and that was it. As far as we were concerned, um, this was the future. So he said, we will support you. And they were, they, they were true to the word. So we, we ended up moving. We sold the house. So that's uh, you and your family. Me and my family. We yeah. sold, sold the house. We went straight in, you know, hook, line and sinker into France. Um, the, the mayor of the town, who's Michel Sapin, who's now a minister in the French government, he's the... Uh, I think he's the um, employment minister, I'm not too sure. He was brilliant, and he set aside a piece of council property. It was completely refurbished for us with brand new laboratories, offices, you name right. it. We got linked up to Nantes Polytechnic. Um, they tested the... Um, the chemistry in, in a laboratory. Yeah, we've seen that report, of course. Yeah. yeah, and and it was demonstrated to be superior. So we had all that technical backup. Um, they also give us gave us a um, a young engineer to help help out, and I got a, a another engineer. So there were four of us in the end. Met Electric SAS. Um, so if you go, sorry, if you, if you could go back. So we started off. I've got to think about this. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> is it way. possible to go? Um, yeah, it's okay. not the end of the world. Uh, what um, I have to do is probably jump. Okay, right. Is it on this one? Yeah. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay. So, what so happened? Where are we looking at now? Right. So, if we look at, uh, okay. So the the cards, the two cards on the left, Sofin over and Truffle Capital, uh, they're two of the three um, investment companies that were give, were passed to me to uh, for me to go and see um, and so, so you're in France I mean and these is, people come to see you yeah well I went to see them I demonstrated to them uh, and there were three of them all said absolutely fantastic this is green technology we will have a an offer to you very shortly one of them right. said right we'll have an offer to you in three days right. And then it was, this was the start of the problem, because then it was, ah, that didn't come. So right. even though we'd got a, a unit that was purpose-built for ourselves, we'd also got some real cash from the system. So the, all the region uh, gave us some start-up yeah. cash. So we were able to operate. Right. Um, but when it came time for the next tranche of investment, which was uh, sort of two hundred fifty k, to head towards K, production, that's right, real, real, yeah, commercial production. Then we didn't, <coughs> um, we didn't. Um, they got turned off. And um, if you walk back, if we walk back a little bit uh, on the, if you remember on the Metallic website, um, there was the sort of disc-shaped batteries, which um, maps, up. maps, uh, as it was called. And then underneath there was a sort of a woven material, which is what I call maps too. But now what we did was play around with weaving a battery, um, which sounds a bit strange, but you can weave aluminium and you can weave right. uh, the, the materials that can make this. So you this, can, have a, you this can have a roll-up battery. Yeah. So you can you can th this is a this yeah. stuff is a is a pressed sort of rolled material which is in layers, but you can actually weave it. Right. So we we tried that and we got it to work. And as soon as we did that, yeah. as soon as we did that, we got a call from the um, the French equivalent of MI uh, five, which is uh, the um, what they call now the um, D uh, DST. So it's, if you look them up, DST. I can't remember the French. It's Direction Surveillance du Territoire or something. So it's they're looking at uh, what's going on internal internal affairs. And we got a, I got a phone call from them. Can, we've been watching you for some time, Mr. Jackson. It's been very nice on the phone. And um, we'd like to come and see you. So um, I said, fine. You know, so they came, had a look at everything, and they said, right, what you've done is strategic and in the national interests of France, and we will support you. That's a pretty crunchy yeah. statement. Yeah, 100%. Strategic and in the national interests of France. Yeah, yeah. And, and I thought, that's it. And, and some friends of mine from 
French friends at, at the school gate, you know, I, I mean, they were keeping an eye on what was going on, they were talking to me. And, and this guy, another engineer, French engineer, he said, look, he said, that's it, you're, you're in now, that's it. If you've had those people come to see you yeah. and say that, you are definitely gonna stay here, you're part of the bricks and mortar, you, you know, you're gonna become French. Right. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So uh, it all seemed really good, and um, there was a there was a there was talk of a of a deal whereby the French government would take I think it was uh, thirty percent of Metal Electric SAS for I think it was about five million euros or something, which would have paid for the the development, and we would have got the support as we went up with all the different layers. To, to production. Yeah. To commercial and, production. And they do that. Fr the, France doesn't mess around. When, yeah. when it wants to do something, it sorts itself out. It doesn't, it, you know, it's very, very highly controlled and very impressive in that respect. But um, unfortunately, that didn't happen for us. Um, we hadn't done anything wrong. Nothing was... Um, failing, you know, all the tests were good and so on and everybody was waiting for this for this yeah, arrangement yeah. to happen. Um, and the case wasn't a case, but the, the a project file was sent up to somebody called um, oh what was his name now? I can't remember. I'll, it'll come back to me, but somebody who worked directly yeah. for Sarkozy. Um, Alain Jouillet, that's it, Jouillet. He was previously head of the Secret Service, but he, he was in charge of following strategic enterprises, which right. seems a strange move. He was also head of Marks and Spencer's as it, as it shut down. Right. Interesting. Mm. And um, anyway, uh, what happened was then we started to get into all sorts of problems. So things like there was a noise on the phone. We had two lines in the office and the lab, and both of those lines uh, suddenly had a noise on the, in the problems. background, some yeah. kind of a, an echo of some kind. And you could imagine all sorts of things about that. And I, I didn't pay much attention to that until it happened at home. So the phone at home had the same noise. We did ring up France Telecom. Oh, we'll send somebody to have a look. They didn't turn up. Um, I had a fax intercepted, which is difficult to do. Um, and I checked. I, I did. I was wondering what was going on, so I did send a test fax to somebody and phoned them and said, "Have you received that?" No, no, I didn't receive. It. Then I phoned them on the phone with the noise in it. And it sounds a bit weird, yeah. this, but yeah. anyway, th it got through the second time. So there was someone. There was all sorts of interference. The, the lab was found open one day. Um, it had been locked up the night before. This kind of thing. So. It, it, this escalated into basically a nightmare whereby um, they shut the bank down, the, the, um, they cut off the gas and electric at home and at the lab, Right. even though the bill had been paid. Um, we had cars outside in the morning that drove off as soon as you came out, somebody was talking on a a funny curly handset that you'd have right. in a military vehicle and it was painted a navy blue that nobody would ever buy. Um, so, you know, reality, um, and because they'd shut the bank down, obviously we were then in serious personal trouble. Right. I managed to get a, a bank account opened uh, with a friend of a friend who'd been f who was a French bank manager in one of the other banks in, in the town. Um, the town was Argenton sur Cruz in the middle of France. And uh, they opened up a bank account and put money in there without us doing anything so we could survive. Um, I couldn't phone my brother either on a mobile because all the mobiles that I bought got killed off sequentially. Um, I couldn't phone my dad and eventually the Metropolitan Police got involved who through a friend of the, he's a friend it's of my brother's. The French police. No, this is the, the UK Metropolitan UK Police oh, because right. uh, being a naval officer, I'd, as far as I was concerned, the balloon had gone up. So I contacted the embassy, the British embassy. I went right. up to see the ambassador, Sir Peter Westmacott. I told him all about it. And all sorts of things started to right. kick in at that point. Well, I'm just going to yeah, say, go on. Just, Sorry. Just yeah, go on. Take, take us through, because we, we, before we get to the end of the programme, we just want to look at some of the documents here, which reinforce yeah, yeah. the fact this is real okay. credit. Yeah. So you have problems in France. Yeah. Some of it's a bit weird. Some of it's a bit 
bit uh, heavy. Mm, very, yeah. And eventually somebody suggests that perhaps you should move back to UK. Which was the ambassador, yeah. He actually said that. Right. So, and, and did he say why? He just said it, that they'd be far more, they couldn't do any help, couldn't help at all in France, but certainly in, in England, um, you know, UK. You wouldn't have this problem? No. Right. So we, we took the hint and, and then we, we basically, um, we got a lot of assistance from UKTI, which is why, um, you know, I think first of all, to sort of underline the French thing, I had no no evidence that the French government was doing this to me, although I think, I think they were being, I think it, latterly parts of it were being used to do this to us because we did get real funding and we did get a, a lab yeah, converted. So it seems so you've got two groups, people who wanted to make the thing yeah, work and yeah. people who perhaps didn't want it That's to work. That's right, yeah. and one, one is over the top of the other one, right. clearly. So, so you, you are gently, it's gently suggested that it would be safer if you come back to, to UK. Yeah. And then you get a bit of help. That's right, yeah, yeah. Right. So does that take us into having a look at some of these? Um, uh, we've got. A, let me just see what we got here. Is this business? Do you want to mention these um, business cards, or we move on? I suppose um, Southwest it? RDA. Obviously, we went to uh, the, the RDA. Stephen Behain. I, I think I've met Mr. Behain actually. Yeah. Um, of course, Southwest Regional Development Agency is one of the quangos which has now been. Folded. It's gone, yeah. It's gone, yeah. Um, so they had a lot of money, um, certainly spent a lot of money in uh, Devon and Cornwall, supposedly on regeneration projects, but mm. many people would say they didn't get value for the money. Did, did you get real help from them? Or? No, I, I met Stephen Behane with somebody down in Cornwall and um, it just didn't seem to sort of, you know, result in anything. So, right. uh, okay. This was despite offering something that is probably an economic trigger to the area, you know. So yes. let's, let's not mess around, that's what it is. Right, so, so, so we've started off by showing the, the technology. Mm. You've talked us through that um, uh, the French gave you real support mm. and it was almost as though somebody was trying to say, well, yeah, let's shut him down. Mm. Let's look at the, the, the publicity, really, around this product. Yeah. So we're reinforcing for people this thing's real. Mm. So. Um, this is part of your website. Um, Sorry, th this was off. This was a, f a brochure that was done in yeah. France for Metalectric SAS, which you can see down in the uh, the bottom left there. Right. So we had an office that, in this town, Argenton sur Cruz, uh, eight route de Chateau Rue. And there's the phone numbers, two okay. lines, as I said. And this show, this is a little leaflet we used to haul around to show that we were doing this. And we had the support. We got this. If you look All in the, the middle column, yeah. these people actually did put money in. Right. Um, yeah, so we in France, they weren't messing around. No, they weren't. Uh, we were in the news. I was in the newspapers. Uh, right. And this is this you. It doesn't look like you, actually. I know it's a bit. Uh, it is, yeah, it is me. Got a little bit of the professor about you in that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was less grey in that okay. one. Okay. Um, so what what was this article saying? So so this is this is Metalectric Tom Peel, which means this is it's. It's come at exactly the right time because right. Argenton was a shirt manufacturing town. It used to make right. uh, shirts that we used to buy here. You know, it was very famous for, for shirts. But all the factories had closed, right. and, they were, and the mayor was desperately trying to find an economic trigger. And, and this he was, was he was a hundred percent behind me. He was excited by you, and he instigated all this PR. So right, okay. And, and what, what have we got here then? So in the middle of this shot here, there's the guy with the glasses on, uh, with the white shirt. He's Michel Sapin. He is currently, um, as I say, a minister in the French government. He's the mayor of Argenton. I'm at the I'm at the computer trying to look intelligent, and the other two guys are, are, are his deputy mayors. So this is um, the entrepreneur Trevor Jackson dreams of um, battery powered vehicles. So um, this right. was one of the press releases. But this was another for a very positive write-up. Uh, all it. positive, yeah. yeah. I was on the radio as well. I mean, it was ludicrous to put a Lancastrian with a ridiculous French accent on, on the equivalent of the BBC in right. France, but that's what they did. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a CD of that. You've got a medal for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, yeah. and then, um, what, what have we got here? We've, we've got a number of, of uh, letters. Now, I, I know they're going to be a little bit difficult for people to read straight off, but if you, uh, if you well, go see, and revisit, sorry, for viewers, revisit it and pause it, and you can have a look. But yeah, th this, is, this is from the UKTI 
uh, this is the Paris Embassy staff who were basically really 100% behind us coming back. And th this was them trying to arrange um, with One North East. It was another of the RDAs. It, this was in Newcastle. So we tried um, the South West. Um, we tried the South West and um, we tried the North East. But the North East didn't want to play because they'd already got Nissan in the background. Right, okay. Uh, this one is the green light letter, so Meta Electric is a, is a formerly green lighted uh, company, one of the very few in the UK. Um, and what, what does green lighted mean? It just means it's it's got exceptional potential as a global company. You've got growth. exceptional potential but we're not going to do anything to help you. Well, so I'm not being unduly <laughs> That's That's for right. you, but that's what it says on there. And, uh, and you know, I, you, I just took it as face value. Um, we, right. we did get connected to our famous engineering motor company via, via that system. So, right, okay, so and I know these guys don't have any money, so the Glo UKTI Global Entrepreneur Programme yeah. is about brochures and about talking to people. It's not about giving, they don't have any mechanism for giving it's, money. It's, it's not about engineering and production and manufacturing, basically. Yeah. And uh, well, this is quite interesting. This is one of the brochures. Um, well, we've got we've got the big man here, Richard Branson. Yeah, we're we're in this brochure. It's online um, as well, so you can find it online. And we're at page seventeen, I think. We're one of seven uh, right, companies. We'll just show you that. We we actually flagged up this. Um, Metal Electric is uh, here on the right hand side, but uh, I found it interesting, you know, this is the sort of language the brochure's using, don't just take our word for it, listen to what our client, <coughs> excuse me, our clients say about us. Um, and you were, you were being pushed very strongly in this brochure. Yeah, yeah, and um, you, you know, it, it all looks good. And this brochure actually is supposed to connect investors, international investors, with companies that need investment. Yeah. But non nothing, there's not one investor that's contacted me through this brochure. Right. Well, we hope this um, production by UK Column Live today is going to make a difference. And, um, right, we've got six minutes to go. Okay. So, um, so quick fly through this. Who knows about it? Um, really nice guys in Nissan in Japan uh, on the battery research side. Uh, you know, if you look at this, it says... Uh, beyond, I work on beyond lithium batteries. Your battery information from Watanabe Sun is very attractive for me. So this is actually a battery research. If you scroll, can you scroll he, down? He asked some questions. All right. right and this okay. Is this is we can see the email. It's from Nissan, um, and this is simply um, it's a candidate for the new power source. This is don't forget these are the people who are doing the leaf at the time. They already knew that uh, lithium mine was not a go, not a goer, and they were looking for something else. And the final one is that he would like to meet me, but that was stamped on, so we, ne we never get we never got to meet. Who stamped on that? No idea. Right. Okay. So everything's going smoothly. He's going to come and see you. He's obviously very interested. Very in keen. What you're doing, and then all of a sudden, boom. yeah. Right. So we've got engineers on one side, and then grown-ups on the other. You know. Okay. Um, I know the print's very small on this, so we're, we're this is, putting up yeah. proof here. This is Ford, so yeah. email contact with Ford. They liked what we were doing, but again, didn't happen. So maybe it'll happen a bit later. Okay. Uh, General Motors, same thing. So everybody is looking at this technology and saying, we like it, it does what it says on the tin. Yeah. And, um, and then nothing happens. That's right. <coughs> so this is um, so we've got a little car in this one this is Myra uh, Motor Industry Research Association um, who basically were very very keen on on, on this um, and in, if you look if you take the time you know, if, you if you have time to look at the, the bit that's greened at the bottom it just shows you it's an aluminium air battery at 430 miles and this was what we did for the, for the Myra study this is the I'm I'm of this little car, so right. again, they motor in, UK motor industry dead centre. They do know about it. Okay, and then you started to write off to people here to see well, if you could get support. Yeah, a bit frustrated by this point, having had all that hassle in France. Understandably, we'd uh, basically lost our house. Um, you know, that, that that that's gone. It's a distant memory. Uh, put everything into it. Uh, 
that's possible, I think, for a family right. to do. Did you get a reaction from this? So I wrote to Prince Charles, because uh, I know he's a Green supporter, um, and he said he's very interested in it, but um, couldn't help. And I can understand that. He's not an engineer, he's not a financier. Uh, but there we are. That, that was the response. Well, I, I'm going to say I'm not sure I can understand because, of course, one of the things that we know he's very good at is lobbying for his own uh, for his own ends. I mean, this mm. has been all over the press. So where he really wants to make something happen, he, he actually gets in there and hits pretty hard. Yeah. And then, of course, we got the MP somewhere. Yeah. Cheryl Murray here. He's very keen on it. I explained it to her. Again, it's all the thing. It ticks all the boxes and it's an economic trigger. They needed an economic trigger. So she goes up to Parliament and says, Mark Prisk, head yeah. of BIS, what are you doing about this? So, yeah. and, and, and what was, was he doing about it? Um, well, if you, if, you, if you go to the next slide, um, basically they recognise... Um, you know, it's, it's very important, it's a fantastically important area of, um, of work and, uh, you know, it's interesting to hear what, what you do and I'll refer you to these, these networks and, um, you it know. It says here, the UK <coughs> government is aiming to make the UK a leader in the research, development, demonstration, manufacture and use of low and ultra low carbon vehicles. So you're ticking all the boxes. This man is giving you all the praise and saying you're doing exactly what the British government wants. Yeah. But nothing tangible happens. No, what you end up doing is going to a load of meetings, a load of committees, and, and with, with people who really, in the end, I, I brought it to a head of BIS. I actually got a lot of chief scientists in BIS. We were just ignored, we completely so I got to his second in command. And in the heat, I can't remember his name, I wish I could remember his name. He said to me, basically, Mr. Jackson, um, you will not succeed. Uh, the policy of this country is for re-electrically rechargeable batteries, um, even though yours is zero CO2 in the West. He says you'll be fighting the government. Right. So I had it in the horses now. And with um, the, other, the other mob, um, what they call now, Carbon Trust, they grilled me big time on, on this. And um, went through the whole economic model with them right. over the phone. They said, well, I'll come back to no, no, no further action. Yeah. So those are the people who are tasked to reduce carbon, and they've got a government money to do that. So you, know, you could become very cynical very easily with this. Well, we but I try and maintain the positive approach because we are moving forward in spite of all this. Yeah. And private investment is, is obviously the way to go. And, you know, um, the, 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 I think the shocking thing is that we do need an industry in this country. We need to start making things again. And we need it. You know, as this Mark Prisk said, to be the centre of this kind of technology world. Well, it's on the plate, it's been here since 2008. Okay. And no one about it, since 2007. So, why not? Yeah. yeah. Right, we've got about 30 seconds to go. Yeah, yeah, people are asking about the contact tracker. Okay, um, right, you can email me on tj at metalelectric, that's metal, E-C-T-R-I-Q-E. Thank you.